everyone, welcome to Eyes on Enterprise. I'm Stephanie Wong, and today we're talking with Brian Dorsey, Developer Advocate for Compute. And we're going to be talking about how to approach cloud infrastructure for enterprises and how to decide where to deploy your workloads. We have a multitude of options on Google Cloud, and so it can be a challenge to optimize for things like scalability, performance, developer experience. So Brian, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I, this is one of my favorite topics, so I'm really excited. That's great to hear. So first off, there are lots of options on compute, Compute Engine, App Engine, Cloud Run, and enterprises, they have a lot of legacy systems and a lot of dependencies in place, like message brokers, databases, web apps. So through the lens of an enterprise, how should they make that initial decision? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it gets complicated. We have a lot of different options, and enterprises are complicated things. So I think um, I like to think about it as kind of an abstraction, kind of a layer cake almost, where at the bottom you have things like VMs, and then you kind of move up and up in layers as you go. So you've got things like Kubernetes or Cloud Run, App Engine, Functions, and they get more abstract as you get kind of closer to the top. And I think enterprises also, they're big, right? So you end up um, often running multiples of those things together to solve the same, you know, in the same system. To be honest, I think a lot of enterprises face this challenge of feeling like they're going to make the wrong decision and they need to make the right decision from the get-go. So how do you help them make that choice to dive in and not feel like they have wasted time and resources investing in the wrong infrastructure option? Yeah, that can be really scary, right? You know, like all this effort and then if you just change things later. Um, so I think there's a few things we can do. You can kind of, you can try to lower the risk. Um, and there's some technical things that we can do that. I think um, running software in containers really helps with that. Um, nearly all of our computer environments support running software that's running in containers. I think that's true for most of the other environments people might be using. Um, so I think that helps a lot. Also, um, you know, you can just decide not to move it, right? You know, you've got a bunch of existing systems. Maybe, you know, I think one of my favorite definitions of enterprise is where most of the software doesn't have an engineering team on it at all. You know, it needs to keep running, it needs to work, but it's the ops folks who are like trying to keep that going. Right. And there, I think VMs are really useful. Um, and you know, once you have some of your software running in cloud, you're trying to make a bigger system out of it. So you start trying to glue it together, and I think that's where serverless and things like that can help. Okay, wait, hold on, serverless. So everyone has a different de definition of serverless. Yep. Even at Google, we have varying products under the serverless ecosystem. So help us define what that is here in this case. I'm not going to do it. Like, <laughs> there's so many definitions of serverless. Um, I think it's a little tricky, but. Um, for the purpose of this conversation, let's focus on the kind of pay for use. You know, like the actual, uh, you do some work and you pay for only that work. Um, yeah. I think that's the, the core definition of service, and I think it'll help in this conversation. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't you argue that that pay for use model applies to Compute Engine too, though? Kind of. Um, so when we're talking pay for use, we're thinking of the actual uh, work being done. And Compute Engine and our VMs and several other things in cloud, you kind of reserve, you're paying while it's on. Virtually, right. so you're paying for the reservation, and you might not be getting any value out of that. It might just be sitting there idle. Um, so there's things you can do to to minimize that, and you want to do that. But the serverless stuff is designed so you're only paying for the actual work being done. Yeah. Okay. You know, a given HTTP request or responding to a message broker or something like that. Right. So it's more event driven. You have the potential to scale down to zero, things like that. Exactly that. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's just talk about these abstraction layers in order, if you don't mind going through them. Totally. You have kind of functions as a service, and you know, our, our thing there is cloud functions. Um, and you know, from a developer, this is a developer tool primarily. Um, from the developer's perspective, you write this like small uh, piece of code, a function, and you kind of push it up to Google Cloud. And you know, we do all of the work of running it. Um, it responds to an event, like you said earlier, or um, you know, that might be something coming in from HTTP or from a message system. Does a little bit of work, maybe a side effect, maybe not, and then returns. That's it. So, what makes serverless a good fit, and like, when would it be something that's more of a constraint for people? So, it's showing up in lots and lots of spaces. Um, so, I think people are exploring all the use cases. So, you know, consider that. Um, but some of the places that are especially strong is in kind of gluing systems together, um, where you've you've got a bunch of existing pieces and you're trying to make them all behave like they're one system. Um, and also in a lot of kind of message flow kind of scenarios where there, people are doing either kind of data transformations or they're moving information from one system to another. Things like that is where it shows up the most for, for this level of the abstraction, that function side. Right. And then besides cloud functions and, and cloud run, we also have our longtime managed service from 2007, App Engine. Totally. And that's been great for developing web applications and the like. So can you explain what App Engine is and what it's used for specifically? Yeah. So App Engine, it's a wider view of the code. You have a, like a full code base. It's still a code-focused kind of environment. Um, and you push that whole code base. It's kind of 
uh, it's really meant for hosting web apps um, primarily. And so you have your kind of the different URLs you respond to and the different code that, that handles that. And it works as one piece. So you've got the code, um, kind of hosted database pieces, and same kind of idea. You have an app. You push it to Google. It runs it, scales it up and down. It's really good for things where it's really bursty. You know where you can't really plan for the usage, and you need to be able to respond, but also not have a bunch of infrastructure sitting there idle when you're not using it. Right, and I can imagine with retail online shops that are expecting huge bursts during events like Black Friday, things like that. Exactly that. All right, so working our way down the abstraction layer cake, we have Cloud Run. Can you tell me about what that is? Absolutely. So it's kind of trying to make the the combination of the containers world and the serverless world and give you kind of the best of both. So uh, from the container side, it lets you run any software that will run in a container and can listen to an, an, a web request, HTTP request, um, or events come in that same way, and serverless. So you get to pay for what you use and only what you use. So you get this hosted environment to run anything you want, basically. So Cloud Run, yeah, it seems like it's something that developers have been rallying for for a while now. They want the portability and the flexibility of containers, but they also want the agility that serverless gives them. Absolutely. So we've mentioned containers a bunch of times already. Okay. What is it exactly? Let's talk about that. OK. So from a a technical standpoint, there's a bunch of things you could take. We're usually talking about Docker containers. Um, under the covers, they're really like actually a tar -GZ, a zip file of some files. Um, practically, though, I think it what it does is it solves the works on my machine problem, right? Like where like something worked in one environment but doesn't in another, but worked on my machine. Like it, so, it just makes things much more consistent wherever you're running them. I think that's the the key takeaway for containers. So, for those that are already running a large number of containers, what would you recommend them to deploy on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's um, what Kubernetes was invented to help with. So, you know, it's basically um, a service, a system, a set of tools, uh, open source environment for running lots of containers across lots of machines, um, but with the idea of treating Instead of thinking about individual containers or thinking about individual computers, you're thinking about the application as a whole, or like microservices you mentioned earlier, and how they fit together, and how the pieces talk to each other, and managing all of that communication as well as the containers themselves, and insulating you from the actual you know, physical or virtual hardware they're running on. Right. So that brings us to GKE, or Google Kubernetes Engine. Exactly. Tell us more about what that is used for. Yeah, so Kubernetes is an open source project, um, and it helps with this. It runs in a lot of different environments. And Google Kubernetes Engine is taking the expertise that the Google engineers and the SREs built, um, you know, building this up and the long time experience of running software at Google to make a hosted version of Kubernetes where we automate, you know, we handle the upgrades to the software, keeping the masters online, things like that, and basically let you focus on the application even more than you would. Um, you know, in under the covers, it's running on VMs and the rest of Google Cloud, but you don't have to worry about that. It's just kind of all handled. It's up. If you want to make it larger or smaller, there's knobs you can turn to, to do that sort of thing. Is there any kind of opportunity for those that are running their workloads on App Engine to move over to Kubernetes Engine, for example? Yeah. Um, and in fact, um, you know, basically kind of all up and down this stack, you know, um, most of the environments allow you to run software in containers. So that's true from um, App Engine, Cloud Run, Kubernetes, and, and VMs, you know, Compute Engine we talk about in a minute. So once you get into a container, you can move things around pretty smoothly. All right. So on GKE, what are you good use cases for and what are some of the constraints? Yeah. So it makes this insulation layer. So you know, that um, is a good example. So if you need to run the same application in multiple different environments, um, so this comes up, you know, for like dev and test and prod for almost everybody, but you can also see it um, come up, you know, when like for writing game servers, for example, you know, you need to be able to run in different legal environments. We're talking enterprises here, right? And large companies have legal specific policies. They have teams that are responsible for different parts of. The systems, um, you need to be able to plug your system into the other things that are already going on in the enterprise. And Kubernetes is especially good at that. It's very modular, and you can connect your different enterprise pieces in at every level, from authentication to policy about firewalls, you know, all the way up and down the, the stacks and get the different teams who are responsible for those involved and in, in working at it at the Kubernetes level. Yeah, are the, and just for performance and also just optimization for utilization of your compute resources, how does it affect that? Yeah, so the utilization is the like the key phrase there. Like that's the reason everybody cares about containers at all. Like so you can run more software on the same machines. Exactly. Um, and you know, that's what containers are for. And you know, 
you know, honestly, why Google cared about it. Like you get more running on the same same hardware, and the same thing is true in cloud as a whole. Um, you know, in cloud utilization usage, you, you know, costs money. So you know, if you can optimize uh, there, it saves you money and hopefully time as well. Yeah. So we just talked about GKE and some of the performance and cost optimizations that you get with it. But I mean, I want to talk a little bit about that low level of abstraction, compute engine. Yep. You know, it gives you a lot of flexibility. You can take care of everything that you deploy on the VM, like software and any installations that you have on it. So when does it actually make sense for you to choose compute engine? Yeah, so this is, it's one of my favorite services because it underlies so much of the rest of cloud for one. You know, GKE, you know, is in turn running on top of Compute Engine, our managed databases are. Um, and I think it's especially relevant for enterprises because you have so much software that you know, doesn't have an engineering team on it, right? You, you need to keep it working. Um, and almost always the best first step for that is to, to move, it may already be running in a VM. And if not, to move it into a VM or move it into a cloud VM. Um, and you can usually do that. It's flexible enough. You can usually do that without uh, having to change hardly anything um, because it is a computer. It's a virtualized machine. So you can run the same things you've been running other places. So you mentioned software that needs to run without a developer team supporting it necessarily all the time. Yeah. So give me some examples there, like any stories that you have. Oh, yeah. So I mean, like this is, I think this is like classic enterprise, right? You know, you've got, um, You've got the team that builds it, and then they have to move on and build the next thing, and build the next thing, and build the next thing. So even in-house software tends to not have active engineering on it. But also, you're buying or renting software from other places that needs to work. Third-party software you have to keep running. Um, and then you know there's, there may just be some old stuff where like you don't know the history of it at all. Yeah. Um, there's that thing that like <laughs> nobody quite knows how to redo, but needs to keep working. Right. Um, and all of those I think are a good fit for running on VMs. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've all been in that case where we're working with software, but the code base is so old. You know, it takes so long to make changes, and you know, maybe it's not the best fit for deploying in a containerized environment right now. Yeah. So, like for anything where you know it's not the right time to um, kind of make changes to it, right? Like, you know, the VMs are a good place to start. So we just went through the abstraction layer cake, as you mentioned, and um, you know, there are a ton of options we just covered. So once again, like to kind of wrap our heads around this, how do you make that decision? Part of it is just this abstraction. Like, how do you want to be working as a team? Um, and if your team is mostly developers, that's going to keep you kind of higher at the abstraction. If you're mostly kind of ops or have deep integration requirements or existing things, you're mostly going to be on kind of the lower levels. There's also some kind of technical constraints. It's worth checking the docs to make sure that these specific things you need are available in each of the environment. Um, and then I kind of mentioned team a little bit, but I, I just want to double down on that. What is your team most comfortable with? What do you care about the most? What do you need to do and want to do as a team? And I think that may also kind of affect things there. Um, the other piece that is maybe not so obvious is just kind of where in the life cycle it is. You know, for things that are newer, um, you kind of have the full range of options. And I encourage people to start high on the abstraction thing and kind of go down if you need to. Mm -hmm. uh, for existing systems, you're usually going to be kind of working your way up from, you know, other VMs or containers up kind of from the bottom. Right. All right. So we talked about so much, but what can people do to actually get started on some of these? Yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, there are a lot of options. And I think if, you know, if specific ones of these jumped out and you're like, oh, that's what I need, you know, go dig into that a little bit. Look at the docs. We have code labs uh, on each of these for what it feels like to actually use and get started on. Um, if you want a bit more information, um, we I did a much longer talk on the same topic, and you can kind of, kind of take a look at that and kind of go from there. Um, but yeah, give it a try. Like, think about how this works for your applications um, and what your challenges are, and and where adding some of this in is going to really help out. Yeah, I think the important point that you made earlier was you don't actually have to move all your stuff to the cloud. You can pick and choose the ones that make sense and then think about which layer of abstraction makes the most sense for your development teams. All right, Brian, thank you so much for being on the show. I encourage everyone to check out Brian's talk where he dives in much deeper about some of these topics. And again, join us next time for Eyes on Enterprise. <laughs>